Hello, my fellow beardos. Are we beardos? Let me start again. Hello, my fellow weirdos. Welcome back to my channel. For today's video, we are doing a book versus movie of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James and The Haunting of Bly Manor. Oh, yes. So you guys, well, have already obviously watched my book versus movie for the Netflix original of The Haunting of Hill House. I'm sure you'll have picked up from my channel if you regularly watch that I'm a massive Shirley Jackson fan. Gothic horror is my jam. It's my jam. So I love that book and that Netflix adaptation is in my opinion one of the best pieces of horror cinema show whatever you want to call it that's ever been made and I will stand over that. You can argue with me but that was perfection for me. It was just all of the good elements. You know when you get that perfect storm, you've got a fantastic writer, a fantastic director, amazing actors, a great storyline, you know, brilliant scenes and settings and costumes and it all just comes together in this perfect storm. That was Hill House for me. So when I heard that they were going to be making The Haunting of Fly Manor based on Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, you bet your bottom, I was excited. I was so, so excited for this series. Did it meet my expectations? No, but I still loved it. And I will explain why as we go along. So if you guys are unfamiliar, first of all, you maybe don't want to be watching this video because this is going to be spoilers, 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 spoilers. For me to be able to discuss the differences between the book and the movie, I'm going to have to tell you what happened in both. Deal with it. So if you haven't read the book or you haven't watched the show, come back after you've done so and then we can discuss it. But I am going to tell you what was different, what was the same, why it worked or why it didn't, and what I thought about both of them. And we're going to jump straight into it. So Turn of the Screw by Henry James takes place at Bly Manor. It is a um, century, more than a century old book about a governess who is hired by a kind of unfailing uncle who has no really urge to be around his niece or nephew. They are his, uh, what do you call it? I can't think of the word where you're like in charge of them. Anyway, he's supposed to be in charge of them, but he can't be bothered with them. So he hires his governess to go out to Bly Manor. There's a housekeeper there. She has to look after the kids and she starts to believe that the location is haunted. That the ghost of the previous driver and the previous governess who committed suicide and both of them had a skin with this love affair. That they are haunting the location, but not only that, they are targeting the children and possessing the children. The book is a fantastic read in my opinion. Again though I'm obsessed with gothic horror so it's just it's my thing so I'm always going to love that book but I understand some people struggle with it because of, of its old-fashioned language and it's quite slow burning but that's why I like it. There is an, a slight ambiguity with the book as well. Um, you can interpret it in two ways. First of all that the ghosts are legitimate and that the governess is fighting off a terrible evil to try to save these children. Second is that she is suffering from a mental breakdown and there are no ghosts, it's all in her head. I firmly believe that the ghosts are real when I read the book. I've had my reasons. I will put my review for Turn of the Screw below so you can go and check that out and find out why. Now unlike Hill House, the Haunting of Bly Manor has taken that storyline and kept very much to the original. We have our governess, we have our children, we have Bly Manor, we have our housekeeper, we have the uncle living in the city and we have the ghost of the former governess and the driver and the threat of possession. So Hill House went in a very complete, very different direction whereas this is very much sticking to the original storyline. So lots of things in common. But there are some differences. These are my notes again. I type them as I'm watching. Okay, so differences. Big one's gonna be the era, okay? Henry James wrote this over a century ago and it is very much a book of that time. Traditional old school governess. This takes place in the 80s. I really thought that that was a good, it, I thought it was a good decision. I think it was a, an easy way to update the source material without having to veer too far off the storyline. So I like that choice. 
also lots of fun 80s wardrobe and music references and stuff so I enjoyed that. Um, again as with the book and the new version we have the story of our governess being narrated to us. In the book it is a gentleman at a party in our TV series it is a woman at the party but in both of those occasions they are telling the governess st governess's story to us and what we are hearing we're not seeing the story firsthand we are being told what happened so that's kind of uncommon um, what is different however is that the narrator has a link to the story in the book the gentleman who narrates it just heard this story from the governess who met her knew her whatever she told him the story but he has no link to the story itself in the series it is revealed that our narrator is in fact one of the pr prominent characters in the series the gardener and the lover and eventual wife of the new governess of our main protagonist so that would be different i thought that was a very clever choice um i think that they took a traditional gothic horror and they kept a lot of the traditional gothic horror elements but they turned it into a really beautiful love story and by making the narrator invested in the tale it just reinforced that and it brought everything to a very neat and um heartfelt conclusion so i thought that was a very clever um very clever decision on mike flanagan's part uh okay where else have we got right we are on both levels dealing with a very slow burning atmospheric ghost story okay set in the british countryside but this is where i had a little bit of an issue in the beginning the book is obviously written by an englishman <laughs> and it is very quintessentially english mike flanagan isn't english and a lot of the cast from Hill House, the ones that are utilised, aren't English either. And the one that is English, they made him have a Scottish accent, which wasn't very good. But anyway, sometimes in the beginning, it was a little shaky for me. It felt like Mike Flanagan was writing it based on how an American thinks an English thing would be. Does that make sense? For example, the little girl constantly being like, perfectly splendid. Oh, I'm such an English child. Oh, England surely good oh it honestly like <laughs> there was points where I just I know that she was using this phrase because it was the original governess's little phrase that she said one of the first things she said to her and she kind of took it up and has made this her little catchphrase yeah very cute but no it was just feckin annoying to be completely honest um the Americans that they use from the original series their English accents sucked balls I'm sorry they sucked um, the uncle and the narrator, mm, not good English accents. And then the English guy from the first series, they gave him a Scottish accent and sometimes he sounded Russian. And I was like, why, why just make him English? There was no need for him to be Scottish. Or just hire a Scottish dude. I don't know. So in the very beginning, because it was a slow burning book and because it was a very slow burning show, but also because they have kind of diverted away from it being a, an out and out ghost story and an out and out horror show and are going for this more of a, an emotive thing. Because of that, because there wasn't any scares or ghosts for me and there was just a shaky English like, oh, we're so British, pip, pip, chin, chin. I was like, oh, it just annoyed me. <laughs> it annoyed me in the beginning, but I got over it because I could see where they were going and once things started to go into motion it's fantastic so yeah but mm, yeah uh <laughs> like in the uh book our driver quint is dead but in the book he dies by getting drunk slipping on some ice and banging his head in the tv show he is killed by the lady in the lake now the lady in the lake is not involved in the book at all there is no other ghosts apart from quint and jessel in the original book okay in typical murphy fashion or murphy in typical mike flanagan fashion he has included a ton of other ghosts 
this area, Bly Manor, is like Hill House and that it is a sort of hub for paranormal activity. And he explains why, because it all stems back to this lady in the lake. She is the one that kills Peter Quint in the series. I loved the lady in the lake. I loved the addition of the new ghosts. I loved her storyline. I loved how, how she created this vortex of souls being trapped there. I thought it was really, really, really well done. Um, and I kind of like, I think, you know, when you think about it, him being murdered by some ghost in the lake is much cooler than just slipping on some ice. So yeah, I liked that. Uh, you also have the fact that our governess and the housekeeper and various other members of staff, they don't know that Quint is dead. They think he has stolen money from the uncle in Scarford. In the book, they all know he's dead. So when the governess says that she's seen him and describes him and is able to say that that's definitely him, um, it's immediately unnerving. It's immediately a big red flag because obviously they know that he's dead and the only way she could see him is if he's a ghost. Uh, he also seduces Miss Jessel in it. So that's very much the same as the book. Um, we have a slight divergence in that Miss Jessel killed herself in both the book and the series but in the series she killed herself because Peter Quint basically kind of makes her do it by possessing her body. He is such a good bad guy. Such a good bad guy. In the book there is a slight implication of abuse on the young, the young boy's part. There's an implication that Quint might have been inappropriate with the little boy. There's none of that in the TV series, but they very much make up for it and create a very evil character of him in other ways. And this is one of the ways that they do that. The housekeeper, we have the same, we have a housekeeper in the book and we have a housekeeper in the series. In the series, the housekeeper actually ends up dying and not realizing she's dead. And we, as, as the audience, don't realize she's dead either. There are clues. I thought they were actually pointed to something slightly different. Um, so when I found out she was dead, it was one of the most devastating things I've ever seen. And I'm not even gonna, I, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I was bawling my eyes out. I was ugly crying the episode you find out the housekeeper's dead. It utterly gutted me. I wanted her to go to Paris with Owen the, the chef so badly. It killed me. It kills me thinking about it now. You know, like when you cry and you're like, sniffle. No, I was like, <laughs> like I was fully bawling it broke my heart oh but she does not die in the book so that's a pretty big difference so one of the um main things with the book is a uh, kind of fear held by the governess of of the morning sexy thing she is very virginal and very naive in it and when she finds out that Quint and Jessel had an affair and that they're now both dead and possibly haunting the children. Part of the fear that she feels is the fear of this brazen sexual contact that they had, this, this, this impropriety. Um, and it's a young woman not burgeoning into sexuality with this sort of like representing this fear of, of sex. Um, in the series, they kind of kept that in, but they did it in a very clever and different twist which modernized that because sex is much more spoken about. It is definitely not as taboo as it used to be. So when you were reading that book back in the day, you know, people would have been like, oh, scandalous. But, you know, everybody has access to porn on their phones and sex is talked about in everything. Every billboard and TV advert now has some kind of relation to sex in it. Sex sells. So what they've done by putting it in the 80s, what the fear that the governess possesses is actually a fear of her sexuality because she is in fact gay um, and she tries to adhere to society's norms and people's expectations by getting engaged to a man but her sexuality is still there, her urges are still there, um, her true self is still there and it's her battle with that is what plays out and it was just a really 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 clever way of doing it. I really loved that. Um, there is the possession thing is is in the book and Quint possesses the young man quite a lot. Miss Jessel doesn't as clearly possess the little girl but in the movie she in the series she definitely does. So that was slightly different as well but I like that the governess in the series isn't an, a complete jerk. 
because the governess is genuinely a good person and she cares about the children and she tries to save them in the end. Um, I, I, I liked her character a lot better in, in, the, in the movie. Um, oh yes, a massive difference is the ending for Miles, the young boy. At the end of the book, Miles is possessed by Quint, Quint and the governess tries to save him and he ends up dying, his heart just stops. Miles is dead. The little girl hates her because she doesn't really understand. She thinks that she's either, I, you know, either she's crazy and there is no Miss Jessel situation or she's trying to take her away from Miss Jessel. But either way, the little girl ends up hating her and Miles ends up dead. In the TV series, she saves the children, both of them. Quint does possess Miles. Um, and the lady in the lake, she tries to take Flora into the lake, uh, believing it's her daughter and the governess is able to stop the lady of the lake from doing that so both the children end up surviving and the way she does that is by kind of absorbing the soul of the lady in the lake and the lady of the lake ends up in her and that kind of puts um almost like a, a stopwatch on her life she will be able to live for i don't know a year five years ten years she doesn't know but that spirit's always there and that spirit is not happy and that spirit needs to be released at some point. But the only way to stop it from hurting people, stop it from trapping souls on the estate of Bly Manor is by her taking it into herself. So she does that, saves Miles because Quint is then able to leave him and be free of Bly Manor, saves Flora from the Lady of the Lake. And then the story continues, which is something again that is very different from the, the book because the book ends with Miles dying and that's that. You, you know, you never really find out um, what happened after that. In true um, Mike Flanagan fashion, we have everything wrapped up with a bow and it is just wonderful. I know the Hill House hasn't a big descending, like did they die or did all that really happen or are they still in the Red Room type situation. In this, you see the governess and the gardener going away together living a long and happy like life together but eventually the lady of the lake comes comes back and the governess has to throw herself into the lake so that she won't hurt anybody the way that the lady of the lake did but also because she is now the lady of the lake along with the ghost she will stop it from hurting anyone or trapping anyone ever again so she dies and the gardener spends the rest of her life um mourning the loss of her her love she got you know 10 12 whatever happy years with her and now she waits for her spirit to return to her that's when you know the blubbering really starts because this isn't a ghost story or a horror like hill house was this is very much a love story this is very much a tale of love and emotion and loss and grief and it is utterly heartbreaking but also so beautiful and it is so wonderfully written and the love story is so gorgeous and I cried so so much you want these people to have their lives together you want them to be happy together you know you find out that Owen took the housekeeper's body and washed her and got her ready for a grave and that he never married because he could never love anybody the way that he loved her and the children actually forget what happened to them and are able to have a happy life and fall in love themselves and even though the house the, the gardener doesn't realize it the governess is there with her and um, watching her and and will be with it they will be with each other again and it's so beautiful and oh it's just not what i thought it was going to be i thought it was going to be like hill house i thought it was going to be scary and straightforward but it isn't it is it's much more complex and beautiful than that and it is much more heartfelt and touching um and i loved it i loved it so so much i think my Flanagan did a fantastic job um I would have loved there to be more ghosts not gonna lie I would have loved there to be more scares and more horror but I admire the direction that he took it in and I think it worked really really well what I love best about Mike Flanagan in both of these series is his ability to tell a ghost story with literal ghosts while simultaneously exploring humanity's nature um, and, and proclivity to hold on to figurative and metaphorical ghosts. I mean, in this series, I've written like a little list 
we have guilt, grief, loss, addiction, poverty, abusive childhoods, abandonment, uh, bad marriages, sickness, Alzheimer's, heartbreak, um, all these things for all the various characters are their ghosts. The uncle is haunted by a, a version of himself because he had sex with his husband's wife. That prompted them to go away on a wee holiday where they ended up dying. He blames himself and he's haunted by his guilt and his grief. The governess is haunted by the guilt and the grief that she feels for dumping her fiance right before he died in a car accident. Um, we have um, Peter Quint being haunted by his abusive childhood. Um, it's just so beautifully played out and he did it in Hill House as well with you know the, the various ghosts that they had ghosts of affairs ghosts of addiction it's just so amazing the way that he writes um so realistically and thoughtfully and um emotively about these topics um w but while weaving them simultaneously and seamlessly with a literal ghost story I just think it's oh it's such a gifted writer I, I love it I love that exploration of humanity through horror because that's when horror is at its best when horror puts that mirror right up to you and says see this you know not all horrors are monsters under your bed or ghosts in the attic horrors are what you carry around inside yourself mm. horror at its best um yeah I just I loved it I love the book love the series I think that the man can do no wrong and I'm excited for his next project. Um, I hope he continues for a long time making these series and I'm very grateful to Netflix for taking them up. But again, I'm going to pass the question off to you guys. What did you think? Do you think the adaptation worked? Do, you know, Did you like the differences between the book and the show? Did you not? Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love to hear your opinions. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button because you know, you're obviously not going to want to miss out on this the bell as well so you never do and then give me likes give me comments i want to hear from you guys i love our nerdy discussions and that's me till now bye